That's the feeling we've all had. Now new shoes would make you glad, but the best time you recall when you wore no shoes at all. Back the day. Hey there and welcome to another edition of Living Lightly. I'm Dan Derica and I'm going to be doing a few videos here showcasing the buildings of Kyle Yoder uh, who has lived here for several several years and initially he bought the Gnome Dome which is an existing was an existing building and around that he has built another building that he lives in now called the Nestle and they're doing some work on the house now uh, doing the earthen floor installing an earthen floor he's been living in there for a few years now but um, didn't have a finished floor and so now he's finishing that up he's putting in some radiant floor tubing and then he's also having a work exchanger do some uh, earthen plastering on the exterior and then he's gonna do a lime wash over parts of that and uh, his buildings are really unique they're uniquely shaped and you know a, made of a, a incredible mix of different natural bu building techniques so I think it's a it's going to be kind of a treat to see what he's got for us. Um, and although this building is not finished, I think it still looks really interesting and aesthetically beautiful. And I can't wait to see what it will look like when it's done. And I like this little, there's a little path here that leads uh, through this section of the village. And he's done some landscaping with his wife, Sarah, on either side of it and in his warren here. Um, some permaculture stuff, there's like some sycamore trees here and some black locusts and then just flowers that I think add a lot of, uh, you know, incredible aesthetic beauty. It's nice to come through here and just see this uh, flush of colors. And then he's got some uh, fruit trees like the peaches there and I think that might be a pear over there. And this is a big sycamore tree right here that he, this is only a few years old but this tree just grows incredibly fast, this species. Kyle has like an uh, unusual amount of stone in his building. We don't have any stone around here, that's why it's unusual, but he's been collecting it um, from Iowa and bringing it over here when he does his job, which is soil surveying. And so he drives around usually in the fall and winter, early winter, and as he tools around, he picks up stones and brings them back here. And so different from most other houses at Dancing Rabbit, there's a lot of stonework in his, in his buildings. Hey, Kyle. Hey, Dan, how you doing? <laughs> um, so my name's Kyle, and uh, I've lived at Dancing Rabbit for about six years now. And behind us, we got my house, the Nestle, we call it, because it sort of nestles into a hillside. And um, we built, the, the majority of the frame and the roof and the walls in my house within about six months. Um, but that was like three and a half years ago. So it's taken a long time to do the landscaping and the finish work. Um, and it's framed with wood uh, and there's some insulation in there as well. But a lot of what you can see right now is cob, clay, sand, and straw. What kind of insulation? Is it just like foam board or something? Yeah, or it's yeah. foam insulation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't... Uh, um, when I framed the house, I wasn't thinking about straw bale. And so then later when I wanted to put insulation in, I didn't have a lot of options. And yeah. so unfortunately I had the, the foam cause I thought that insulating it well was more important than, than not insulating at all. Yeah. So, um, then on top of the, of the insulation, I've done some pretty extensive, um, flowing organic designs that I'm savvy to. Um, and so like two years ago, I actually did a lot of this like bench work and, and landscaping, uh, just it's like a lot of it was cosmetic, but it also helps to strengthen up the, the whole frame of the house to some degree. And, um, so it's interesting here because you can see, um, a lot of this is the original cob material. And some of the stuff, I'm not sure how well you can get it with the camera, but a lot of it um, has stayed like pretty, pretty protected by the overhang. And like not a lot of the elements have hit it. <laughs> but then in other spots, like if you get over into here, you can see that a lot of the clay has washed away over time, leaving more of the sand and the straw exposed. 
And so essentially it's just, it's eroding with, with time and with the elements hitting it. And so then like some of this stuff, I actually, I, I put more material on just recently. And now eventually, like finally, we were getting around to plaster the house. And so that's what Claire has been working on. And um, so we've been using uh, an earthen plaster, which is two parts sand and one part clay. Um, we are blessed and cursed with having a really heavy clay um, base subsoil here. And so um, it's super sticky, even, you know, even just like half of this is clay, but you can see, you can still see like how, how sticky that is. Mm -hmm. Like I can basically just do this and then I don't know if it'll quite work, but it <laughs> fell there, but it's still pretty sticky, even though it's double the sand than to the clay. Mm -hmm. And then we amended it with um, cattail fluff for fiber. And we also used um, cow manure for the enzymes and for the extra fiber in there. And um, I am by no means a plaster expert. This is the first major plaster job that I've done. But that's one of the things that I love about Dancing Rabbit is that we were able to go down the road and talk to Hassan, who is a plaster expert, and he could tell us everything that we needed to know about plastering this house. And then uh, Claire has been, has been working on it since. And most people will use like a Japanese trowel to apply it to the wall, um, but my house is so irregular that we've had to use um, just much smaller sheets of plastic to sort of like work it into the to the corners. And so that is all that I will say. And Claire can tell you what what she's been working on. All right, okay. I've been working on just kind of the tentacles or roots that are kind of on this side. We um, did the adjacent side about a week ago and it's really just all these weird curves that are taking a lot of time. Otherwise, uh, we would be able to plaster really, really quickly with mm -hmm. uh, all the different kinds of trowels we have here. Um, it's pretty easy. I just gotta make sure that the thickness is even which is uh, harder to do on these parts because you don't know if you're hitting like a uh, indentation and you need to apply more clay or not. What else I know is you're there? spraying these, you're spraying it down with water before obviously to, to get the initial uh, cob there yeah. wet down and make a better. Yeah, it appears better that way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So by wetting it down, it does two things. One, it just helps that any clay that's on the surface, it just gets it it sort of activates it and gets it wet again so it's stickier so that the bond between the plaster and the existing cob is is just a better bond mm -hmm. and the second thing that it does is um, if the existing surface is too dry then when you put the wet plaster on it will suck the moisture out of the plaster more quickly and the more quickly that the plaster dries then the more likely it, it is to crack because it, it shrinks more violently. And so the slower you can get the plaster to, to shrink and to dry, the better it is. And so if the wall is wet, then it's gonna dry out a lot, a lot more slowly. And this layer of plaster, this finished plaster you're putting on is pretty thin. I mean, it's probably like a quarter of an inch or less in some spots. Yeah, Hassan was telling us that three sixteenths of an inch is what he shoots for. Uh -huh. And so like that's, Yep. That's the level of precision that, that he goes for. And this wall is so irregular that it's hard to get it like extremely uniform. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's it's very it's a very thin skin. Yeah. Um, and then once this is on, um, pretty much as soon as the whole house is done, then we'll work from the the end that we started on and we'll apply a lime wash, which is just um, uh, like one part lime. Uh, type S masonry building lime. Uh, that's been slaked. And we, we've slaked it for, we've had some, we have some that we've slaked for the last year. And so that has really allowed the water to get in there and make it really flexible and, and plastic, plasticky. And um, so one part lime to, um, I think like four parts water is what we're gonna go for. And then, so it'll be pretty, it's like a thin paint and we'll just paint it on. 
and we'll probably put on um, between like three and five coats. And that, so the lime is just much more um, of a durable material against the elements. And so, you know, talking about like the erosion that that has been going on this building, it's like that lime will just um, help resist the, the raindrops as they fall down and hit on it. Yeah, you won't have to maintain it as much, hopefully if it works out well. And you're gonna mix, you're, you said you're gonna mix it with lin linseed oil, is that something you're Yeah, gonna we're try? actually gonna put some linseed oil also in the lime wash, and that is, again, just to help with the weather resilience mm -hmm. and, and the durability. Um, and we might like put on a base, like two coats for the whole house, and then put extra coats on in the areas like, you know, over here especially, where like the roof is sort of protecting this, but it's still subject to a lot of the western winds that come in. And so we'll probably put more coats on some of these like little um, root outcropping things, mm -hmm. and that'll protect it better. And it also will sort of like help um, make them like pop to the eye visually. So that's the plan. We're going to experiment with some different pigments in that lime wash also and see um, see what we like. We got these tomatoes hanging down. There is a living roof on this structure as well, and we'll go up there and look at it in a couple minutes. But he's planted tomatoes up on top of the living roof and they sort of dangle down over in front of these windows, adding a little bit more shade in the heat of summer. because it was the deepest part and there's it sort of goes down deep enough to have a good space there to to have a root cellar it's like right next to where my kitchen is where I want to be able to be to access the vegetables in it and this root cellar is about three feet deep this way it's about four feet in length and then about three feet deep down and it's just been a great place to store vegetables over the winter um, it usually hangs just above freezing, which is just the 